everybody. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started and I'll do introductions and some stragglers can get let in as we go on. Um, I'm Sarah Rosencrantz. I'm the Exhibits and Education Assistant for the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. Um, so welcome to our Coffee and Curator Talk. It's our first one of the summer. Um, and in case this is your first one, um, it's going to be a 10 minute talk followed by a 10 minute Q&A. So any questions you have as Kelsey goes through her presentation, just throw them in the chat and I'll read them out loud at the end um, and we can get some good discussions going. Um, and we also do this once a month. So look out for our future upcoming ones. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Kelsey Grimm is the librarian and archivist for the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. She received her master's degree in information and library science, specializing in rare books and special collections in 2013. Um, and since working with these collections, one of her major projects has been to organize and make available the documentary materials that relate to the history of archaeology in the American Midwest. A large part of today's session um, started a few years ago when the Indiana Historical Society developed the exhibit, You Are There, 1939 Angel Mounds. So welcome, Kelsey, and thanks for doing this presentation. Hello. Hopefully everyone can see me. All right. Just adjusting things a little bit. All right. Hello. My name is Kelsey Grimm. I use the pronouns she, her, and am female presenting with white skin and long blondish hair. I'm the librarian archivist for the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, as Sarah just said. And for today's coffee and curators talk, we'll be taking a tour through the various collections related specifically to the year 1939 at Angel Mounds. Tinted in red is a picture of Mound F at Angel Mounds. Angel Mounds is located along the Ohio River in what is today Southern Indiana, an almost two hour drive south from IU Bloomington where I am. The people who lived on those lands prior to colonization, archeologists identify as Mississippian, but they didn't call themselves that. They didn't call it Angel Mounds. They didn't call it the Ohio River. And they definitely didn't call this Indiana. Today, we identify some of those groups who lived at Angel Mounds as the Delaware, Miami, Shawnee, but those names don't capture how modern day tribes identify themselves. It doesn't identify tribes who lived on these lands, but wouldn't or couldn't sign the treaties, nor do we know the names of the ancestral groups who preceded them all. I encourage those of you listening to learn more about the tribes from the Ohio River Valley, but hope this session spurs you to listen and learn about Native peoples in and from your area as well. As this is a short talk meant to be consumed over one's coffee break, we'll briefly highlight the manuscript collections of Glenn Black and Eli Lilly, some of the image collections, and the archaeology collections. On the left is a black and white image of Glenn Black drafting an imprint of one of the Mississippian houses uncovered during the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, uh, the excavations that began in 1939 under his management. On the right is a screen capture of the Glenn Black Mass, the manuscript collection, finding aid on archives online. Largely, this collection contains correspondence about and the administrative records for the WPA project at Angel. So let's start at the beginning. On the right is a scan of a letter from November 22nd, 1938, addressed to Glenn Black from Naomi Whitesell, Assistant Director of the Women's and Professional Division of the WPA, letting Glenn know that the Indiana Archaeological Project has been approved. And once there's presidential approval, he will then be able to start operations as soon as he's ready. Another example of the kinds of information you can tease out of the archive, labor, wages, and financials, a very exciting topic. On the right again is a memorandum of supply purchases from April, 1939. I've circled here, one ruby eraser was 10 cents. 
At the bottom of the page, it shows the salary for Glenn Black. As I mentioned, he was the head of the whole project. He was paid $275 per month, and his right-hand man, William Rood, also known as Bill in a lot of the correspondence, was hired at $90 a month. This lovely yellow page sweeping in from the bottom is a time report for Willis Tatum. He was a laborer in January of 1940 at this, for this document. And the blue circle there shows that he was paid $3.52 for eight hours of work. If we do a little bit of math, that's 44 cents an hour. And taking inflation into account, as of 2022, that's $9.04 per hour. I looked it up this morning and the federal minimum wage today is $7.25. So <laughs> I mentioned Eli Lilly at the top of the presentation. Eli Lilly is a prominent figure in Indiana history and in various disciplines, but specifically in archeological history. Being part of the Lilly Pharmaceuticals, his wealth gave him the ability to help fund the purchase of Angel Mounds, saving it from imminent development, which allowed the archeological excavations to occur in 1939 and in the years since. Eli Lilly was also probably just honestly interested in the pre-colonization era and the then mystery surrounding the earthen mounds. Here in this telegram, Eli is notifying Glenn that he and his wife, Ruth, will be arriving early after lunch Friday as possible. He visited Angel Mounds several times during 1939, which we can figure out from the correspondence back and forth. And it led me to wonder about this next postscript where Eli suggests getting an air conditioner for Glenn's house at Angel Mounds. It would require, quote, 20 to 30 gallons of water per hour in order to keep temperature. In the following letter you see here, Glenn responds, I think unless the weather becomes unbearable that the air conditioner would take a little too much water to take a chance on in hot, dry weather. Eli wanted an air conditioner, I believe more for his comfort when visiting, but Glenn didn't wanna take the water away from the men working in the field on the project as the site was fed on well water at the time. So just little bits of information. Our next major collection that we'll peruse are the archeology span photographs of the image collections. At the top of the screen, it's a screen capture of the image collections online platform where you can see a lot of what we have digitized. So we'll start off here with a few of my favorite prints and slide images that we've digitized. I'll say that when I first started researching um, the WPA project of 1939, my focus being a non-archeologist was on the people and not necessarily the archeology. span So that's what you'll see here. The black and white image in the top left, let's see my laser pointer here in the top left, is of the surveying crew who spent weeks walking, measuring, and laying out the grid of Angel Mounds so every artifact could be properly located on the site. The top middle image shows some of the first artifacts uncovered waiting to be measured and recorded by the single engineer hired for the project. Most of the men who worked at the WA, WPA project had hardly heard of archaeology, let alone studied it. This exacting time consuming technique in the picture called pedestaling did not last long, maybe only about 100 artifacts, which was within the well within the first month. The top right image is a feature of three excavated pits that we'll talk about more in a minute. Bottom left image here is an in action print of men screening shovelfuls of dirt looking for little artifacts. And the final picture on the bottom right here is of an erected tent to keep the men cool in the middle of the summer in Southern Indiana along the river. It can get very hot and humid. This next slide features a few image negatives that we've digitized. The image along the top, I love because you can see some of the tools and how the men are working. There's buckets here. 
and there's brown bags, which they're putting the artifacts in. And in the back right over here, there's a wooden bellows. There's no staging. This is just them working and it's a picture. Um, the bottom left image here shows the walls that were left between each excavated unit. It created this honeycombing effect that's pretty recognizable of Glenn Black's archeology span at Angel Mounds in 1939. The men grouped in the back here, in the back right, are beginning to take these walls down. And this final image is a crop of the full image um, focusing on two men at work. And I just love their little page boy hats and overalls. So I had to put it in here. Mm -hmm. Our last major collection to highlight are the archaeology collections. This picture is some of our new high density storage shelving. Archaeology collections are split twofold if you want to think about it. You have the artifacts, the objects on one hand, and then the documentation about those artifacts, what we call the associated documents. Well, let's look at a few of the artifacts. Um, there are a variety found at Angel. Um, you'll, we may have to ask some of the archaeologists if you have questions about them. But the top left here is what I would say the site is most known for. It's the negative painted pottery. And this is a beautiful sun design. That's one of my favorites. There are ceramic vessel pieces like the top middle. The bottom left is animal bone. This is specifically a turkey bone that was used as an awl. The middle bottom is identified as an owl effigy rattle. And the red object on the right here is a catlinite pipe that has a snake design etched down the back. <clears throat> and the associated documents. They, they, on the other hand, tell us more about the objects that were uncovered and give us more contextual clues for research purposes. Since excavation is largely destructive in that you can never return a site exactly to how you found it, a lot of information and data has to be collected, even in 1939. The notebooks here in the back are some of my personal favorites because of the beautiful handwriting that Glenn had uh, and some of the other men and the diagramming that you can start to see. But there are also the original catalog cards here in the top middle and early report write-ups like in the top right here. Let's take a minute to make connections between some of these collections. Remember those pits that I showed a minute ago? The uh, pictures on the left here show those pits identified as feature two in X7D before excavation here on the top and after on the bottom. We have the journal entry over here that Glenn Black made with his beautiful diagramming that I absolutely love. <laughs> and then this information got published. We see that in the Angel Mounds site volumes. Uh, and here on the right is the specific page where they talk about feature two in X7D. Another fun connection I made was about a ceramic vessel identified um, as X7D 121. On the journal page here, where the circle is, there's a small drawing of what Glenn thought the pieces looked like. They uncovered pieces, and this is what he thought they would look like once they were pieced back together. Here's a picture of those pieces with a paintbrush for scale. <laughs> Another uh, angle to this, the, the sherds here in black and white. And here is a modern image of the vessel once somebody has put the pieces back together. And then finally, here is that vessel on exhibit at the Indiana Historical Society in that previously mentioned exhibit. You are there in 1939. I hope you've enjoyed this little excursion. It's a very quick perusal of some of the collections here of 1939 Angel Mounds. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or the archaeology staff. I'm going to throw them in there. Our museum is on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we also have a YouTube channel where this video will also be posted. Um, Please give us a follow to be notified of upcoming events and the official opening of our newly renovated building. We'll go ahead and stop.
Oh, that was wonderful, Kelsey. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, we have so much cool stuff. It's like, you never know what you're gonna find. Um, so anyone who has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, to start off, Kelsey, do you have a favorite, like interesting or surprising fact you found while digging in the archives? Um, some of that was what I threw in there, like the air conditioning. Um, when I was researching this, the exhibit up at the Historical Society had a um, an actor portion where you could go in, like step into a photograph and talk to the actors. And so our job a little bit was to find cool information. Um, and the actors had to act as if it was 1939. And I didn't realize air conditioning was a thing in 1939, but it wasn't widespread. Um, and it used obviously a lot of water and Glenn didn't want to take that from the men. So I, that was one of the cool bits of information that I figured out. Um, the wages, the, they only hired men for the project, which kind of makes sense um, for the time that it was. There were some men who tried to steal things. Um, there were there was a survey or watchman um, who got lazy at one point and was driving a car around and missed a, um, a like a check in time. There's a lot of information that can be found through this stuff. And I, like I said, I was focusing on the people of uh, of the project. And there's a, a whole other side to the artifacts and the information that they recovered. Right. So that's more the archaeologist. <laughs> Yeah, that's super interesting because I feel like you usually learn about like the site leaders and not necessarily like the workers so much. So that's interesting that there's all those details. One other thing I, I'll just random facts, right? Um, the youngest man person they hired was a 16 year old. Um, and he, they didn't want to, he wasn't physically able to do some of the work. Um, and so, but he had a talent for drawing. So they had him drafting images of what they uncovered. Um, Glenn was also really good at separating the men. So there were specific jobs for each of the men. There was um, shovelman, barrelman, and neither, and they didn't cross over, right? And there, were, there was a story um, that Glenn wrote about a barrelman who was adamant that the shovelman had to like fill up his barrel all the way. Otherwise he was gonna be very cross. Um, so they took pride in their work. Even if they didn't study this, they trained and they took pride in their work too, so. Yeah, that's awesome. So one question um, from the chat is, what untapped potential do you see in the archival collections, like future research? Untapped potential. Um, well, there's more stories, right? Like I haven't read, my job is not to read every letter in the in the collection. My job is to make it accessible. So um, the little bit of research that I've done is to, is to tease all of you to come in and get their other stories out. <laughs> um, and if people want to do that, do they contact you? Is that the best way? Yes, yes. I want to make this as open and available as anybody wants to come in and get it. Um, there, with archeological material, there is uh, some information that is protected. So um, specific site information, that kind of stuff, we have to be a little careful about, but Angel Mounds is a state historic site. Um, and so working with the materials here uh, should be a little easier. I'm not gonna say everything can be published, but, but people can come and look at the stuff if they want, yeah. Um, the connections between, um, we've started connecting right between the archives uh, and the archaeological material, but that's a project currently that's happening is connecting the archival correspondence with the artifacts that are downstairs. Cool. And then Nicole asked, are any of the photographs in color? Yes, they are. Yeah, if um, that, a lot of the slides are in color. Um, the negatives obviously are in black and white, but I think there are some color negatives as well. Um, and most of the prints, I believe, are in black and white. But yes, there are color images online uh, from 1939 and 1940. A lot of the 1940, actually, um, Mound F was the 
excavation, what they focused on in 1940, I believe. And a lot of those are in um, color. So yeah, they're very, it's really cool. That was one of the things too, for the exhibit. Um, there's a lot of blue jean material, um, which is kind of cool too. Uh, again, you don't necessarily get the fabrics from the pictures, but yeah, the men, a lot of the men were dressed up in their leathers. Um, they had like leather shoes on and things like that. They didn't have sneakers, right? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and then Gail asked, did the Glenn Black Project find any human remains? There were human remains that were uncovered. Um, those being ancestors, um, that's not the focus of this talk, but there were there were ancestors who were uncovered. Um, recently, uh, we have returned those ancestors back to Angel Mounds too. Um, so if I am not an expert on that area, um, but if you have more specific questions, the archeology span staff here can probably help you with that. Yeah, and that's some of that protected information, like if it appears in photos and stuff, a lot, we don't necessarily give access to that to just anybody, I think, right? <laughs> right, yes, yeah. Um, I mentioned that uh, most of the digitized material is available online. Uh, not all of it, specifically because we don't post pictures of ancestral remains. And then Paula asked, well said, she has a friend who is a descendant of the Angel family. And could you talk a little bit more about how the land came onto the market and what its state of and what its state of preservation at the time? So how it got on the market, how it became a state uh, historic site. Okay, um, I don't know the full story. I know a little bit about it. Um, we have a plat map of 1938 um, of the land that becomes Angel Mounds. Let me see if I can pull it up really fast <laughs> to show it. Um, and Angel. It was farmland at the time. So, um, the there's a large it's a large area of land and at the time in 1938 when they did the land survey angel actually owned a pretty small portion of it at the time but mound f which is that big mound that i pictured in red um was on the angel property and that's what everybody kind of knew and focused on um Actually, the largest amount of land was owned by the Grimm family. No relation to me, I believe. <laughs> uh, but the Grimm family owned it. Um, and then there was another family as well. So there were like three or four families who owned the land that was eventually purchased to become what is today Angel Mounds State Historic Site. Um, there was initially in 1931, there was a survey done uh, by the Historical Society. There was, it was like a, a archeological road trip actually, which is another story. Uh, but they identified this land as uh, a major archeological site in the state of Indiana that needed to be protected. Uh, the city of Evansville was looking at it for um, development. I believe a golf course was thrown around at one point. Uh, so there was a, uh, a bid through, through the 1930s and the most of the 1930s, they were trying to get the people of Evansville to take an interest in Angel Mounds and, and purchase it and save it for the state. But they didn't end up raising very much money at all by the time that um, the land was coming due in 1938. And so this is where Eli Lilly donated the money to the historical society who then was able to purchase the land. Um, Eli Lilly, I believe, did it quietly. Uh, and so it, he he didn't broadcast or advertise that he was putting up the money at the time, but we know now that it was him. Um, and so there was uh, the Historical Society. And then later after Glenn's death, I believe, there was an agreement that was made between the State Museum, Indiana State Museum, Indiana Historical Society, and Indiana University. Um, and there's a three-way joint ownership of the land now, I believe. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> um, and we are over time, actually, because we had all these great questions. But so I'm going to wrap up unless there's any last minute questions someone wants to throw out. I'm going to quickly look for that land flat map. So if you want to stick around for a minute, 
I'm going to pull that up. <laughs> but yeah. All right. And so while Kelsey digs for that, I'll go through my like closing spiel. Um, like I said, at the top of the program, Coffee and Curators is a monthly online virtual event that we do every month. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about Angel Mounds next month, Ed, our director, is going to talk about how the Angel Mounds align with the summer solstice, the stars, the moon, talking about the celestial alignments with the site. So it's going to be great. And it will be uh, on June 9th at three o'clock. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen really fast so I can show you <laughs> this. All right, can everybody see it? Yes, looks okay. good. So that's the plat map. Uh, and this is what become is the site now. Um, and here is Becker and Len on the left. Alois Heerdink in the middle, Ralph Angel and Eugene Angel have this small sliver here, Anna Grimm, John Grimm, and John Grimm are here on the east side. So just a fun little yeah. plot map from 1938. <laughs> yeah, the Angel property really is the small sliver out of that whole thing. By that time, um, I believe in the late 19th century when the Smithsonian was doing some surveys, um, the angels may have owned more of that land, but by the time in 1938, um, they just owned the, the small sliver that Mound F was on. Right. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelsey. I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up, but we had a great time. I can't, I don't know if you're seeing, there's lots of thank yous and great jobs in the chat. So. <laughs> All right, bye everyone.